The radius is a lateral bone of the forearm. It consists of three parts, the proximal extremity, the shaft, and the distal extremity. In this video, we're going to use a right radius. The proximal extremity consists of a head, neck, and tuberosity. The head consists of two articular surfaces, the fovea and the articular circumference. The fovea articulates with the capitulum of the humerus. The articular circumference is the thickest portion of the head and it articulates with the radial notch of the ulna. The head of the radius is held in the radial notch of the ulna by the annular ligament. The neck is located between the head and the tuberosity. On the posterior aspect of the neck, there is a rough area for the attachment of the supinator. Distal to the neck is a radial, or bicipital tuberosity, which lies in the anteromedial portion of the proximal extremity and is the insertion of the biceps brachii tendon. The shaft expands in width from proximal to distal and has a slight lateral convexity. The shaft consists of three borders that form three surfaces. There is an anterior, posterior, and interosseous border, and an anterior, posterior, and lateral surface. The anterior border originates at the base of the radial tuberosity. It spirals inferolateral and ends distally at the suprastyloid crest. The proximal third of the anterior border is prominent and forms the anterior oblique line. The anterior oblique line is the origin of the radial head of the flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor pollicis longus. The area above the line gives origin to the supinator. The lower fourth of the anterior border is prominent and is the insertion of the pronator quadratus. The suprastyloid crest is a tubercle and is located proximal to a styloid process and is the insertion of the brachioradialis muscle. The interosseous border forms the sharp medial edge of the shaft. It serves as the attachment site of the interosseous membrane. The interosseous membrane divides the forearm into an anterior and posterior compartment. About 5 cm proximal to the distal end of the radius, the interosseous border divides into two ridges that form the anterior and posterior margins of the ulnar notch. This triangular area between the ridges is also known as the medial surface of the distal radius. The posterior border begins at the posterior aspect of the neck and ends distally at the dorsal tubercle, also known as Lister's tubercle. The anterior surface lies between the anterior and interosseous borders. The proximal three-fourths is concave and serves as the origin of the flexor pollicis longus. The flatter distal portion is covered by the pronator quadratus. The nutrient foramen is located at the proximal aspect of the anterior surface. The lateral surface is convex and is located between the anterior and posterior borders. The proximal portion provides attachment for a portion of the supinator. In the middle portion, there is a rough oval shaped area known as a pronator tuberosity, which is the insertion of the tendon of pronator teres. The pronator tuberosity is the maximum point of convexity of the lateral surface. The distal portion is smooth, and the tendons of abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis cross over this area. The posterior surface lies between the posterior and interosseous borders. The proximal third provides attachment for the supinator. The middle portion provides origin for the abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. The posterior oblique line is located at the proximal aspect. It extends from the base of the radial tuberosity and distally to the pronator tuberosity. The distal extremity is the widest portion of the radius. It consists of five surfaces, anterior, medial, posterior, lateral, and inferior. 
The anterior, posterior, and lateral surfaces of the distal extremity correspond to the anterior, posterior, and lateral surfaces of the shaft, and these are non-articular regions. In addition, the distal extremity also contains the medial and inferior surfaces, and these two are articular. I think it's helpful to approach the distal extremity by dividing it into its articular and non-articular surfaces. Let's start with the non-articular regions. The anterior surface contains the suprastyloid crest. The lateral surface is prolonged and forms a styloid process. The posterior surface contains a prominent tubercle known as Lister's tubercle. Medial to Lister's tubercle are grooves that allow passage for the tendons of extensor indices, extensor pollicis longus, and extensor digitorum communis. Lateral to Lister's tubercle are grooves that allow passage for the tendons of extensor carpi radialis brevis and extensor carpi radialis longus. Now let's talk about the two articular surfaces, the medial and the inferior. The medial surface contains the ulnar notch. This area articulates with the ulna to form the inferior radial ulnar joint. The inferior surface is also known as the carpal articular surface and is divided into a medial and lateral portion. The lateral portion articulates with the scaphoid and the medial portion articulates with the lunate. I want to take a moment and talk about distal radius fractures. The most common is a Coley's fracture, which is a transverse fracture that occurs about one inch proximal to the wrist joint. It's often seen in the elderly and is due to a fall on an outstretched hand. Or you can say the mechanism of injury is hyperdorsiflexion. So you can imagine that someone is about to fall and they put their hand down in this position to catch themselves and the wrist joint hyperdorsiflexes. And when this occurs, the distal fragment would displace posteriorly. And the opposite of a Coley's fracture is a Smith's fracture, which is when a person falls on a flexed hand. In this case, the distal fragment will displace anterior. Both Coley's and Smith's fractures are extra-articular. An intra-articular distal radius fracture is known as a Barton's fracture.